Thank you very much, Rowley. I do want to say good morning and hello to everybody. And thank you all very much for coming out. And I know that this is uh, Good Friday, and some of us are highly committed to uh, our relationship uh, with our uh, Savior on this particular day. So I do thank you for being here. I'm very excited. I'm so super excited to see all of you. And of course, to have your support. So, on behalf of uh, Indiana Parenting Institute and the staff of Indiana Parenting Institute, who will be looking at this later, I do want to just thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to ask our board chair, Martin Rivas Ramos, who is with who is the vice president at First Midwest Bank, to come forward and um, together. We will uh, not only welcome you on behalf of our board, but also uh, we'd like to take an opportunity to just kind of recognize you and say hello to you. Uh, see who's in the audience. Okay, so we're looking forward to presenting a great program for you today. So please join me in welcoming my board chair. <laughs> change that they have gone through over those eight years has been tremendous. And it is all because of the hard work that Laura and the staff does. Um, they have uh, not just impacted families in Northwest Indiana, uh, in South Bend, in Indianapolis. They are being recognized for the good work that they do. And we hope to just grow, uh, uh, not too fast, uh, but uh, you know enough to help all families in Northwest Indiana. You know, I, I think when we all think about the time that we grew up, it was so much simpler back then. We were talking with our newest board member uh, about how easy it is to talk to your kids, but believe it or not, there are people out there that don't know that you can have a reasonable conversation with your children. You don't have to yell at them. You don't have to speak with your voice. Uh, loud, and you certainly don't need to degrade them. And so uh, the work that IPI does uh, kind of helps parents understand that their kids are little people, and they're going to grow up to be big people, and we want them to grow up to be good, big people, right? Um, so, again, thank you all for being here. Turn it back over to Laura. Okay, so my job to tell you a little bit about why we are gathered here today. We, when this organization started um, in 2007, I got to tell you, I, I need to tell a little short story, and I hope I do it quickly, about um, how people can easily be influenced by what other people say to you, especially sometimes when it's a very negative. And one of the things that happened to me as I was putting together the idea of Indiana Parenting Institute, actually from the heart which is how we originally started, was being given to me uh, because I had never really thought about parenting ever. So you know that. Okay. Um, but the idea, I moved to this town and I didn't know anyone here. And what happened is that I started driving from Maryville to the train station here in Gary, and I would see kids that were not in school. And I would also come home, at that time I was heavily into news. I would come home and I would hear parents talk about uh, the fact that when their kids were in trouble, that they had, did, you know, they had done everything they knew how to do. And so for some reason that resonated with me. Because my experience as a parent, it was challenging, but it was fun, I gotta admit. I mean, it was like having a little bud uh, to grow up with, especially after my husband died. It was just the two of us, you know? 
And so we just got to know each other and uh, have fun together. So my 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 thought was, well, why are these parents having all these issues with their kids? You know, what's happening? I'm having fun. Why aren't they having fun? And so the idea of Indiana Parenting Institute began to formulate in my mind. And all of a sudden, it just started overflowing. If you understand what I mean. It just started coming out of me. And I just started writing and writing and writing. So then I learned that I could apply for a 501c3, you know, have a real business. You know, I always thought I was going to be a successful business person. Anyway, so that just seemed like a natural thing. Um, and so I started, and um, I did my, uh, I submitted the 501c3, but it took me three years to do it, and do you know why? It's because people kept telling me that they, no one would ever approve it. They won't approve this, they won't approve this. And so when we work with our parents, we think about the same thing. But they've gone through a lot of experiences where people have said to them, this won't work, this won't work. You can't do this, you can't get out of the situation, you know, you're stuck here. So our whole focus has been working with families so that we can actually help them overcome those perceived barriers to their success. And I'd like to feel that we are having uh, some success uh, doing that based upon um, what we see happening, the good things that are happening with our parents and their relationships. But anyway, I digress. So my talk here is to talk a little bit about the case of Mary Christine and Jake Miller. So that way um, I'll be done in just a minute. Um, Parent Awareness Month is a program of our responsible parenting campaign. Uh, it is a month long community statewide engagement that calls attention to the need for effective and responsible parenting to protect and advance the well being of children, families, and communities. Got to have uh, education for our parents. As much as we think they know how to parent, I want to tell you that a lot of them are struggling uh, every day to connect with positive things for their children. It is one of the original initiatives adopted by the Indian Parenting Institute at its original establishment, the non nonprofit institute in 2007. Over the years, it has continued to build support from parents, state and local legislators, and professionals in the community. I think the first um, parenting awareness, actually the second one we had, I think we had about 15 months. But you know, we were committed to the cause. Its overarching goal is to create a paradigm shift in the way people view parenting as a natural and intuitive ability to one, um, in our expanding and culturally influenced society that require education and training for families and children to work in well not just babies. You gotta look at a broad picture. Because if you look at kids today, they're all having issues. And we learn that it crosses both social benefits and housing. So sometimes we look at what's going on in uh, the urban community, but let me tell you, based upon our experience with the families, it's across the board. It is also um, a goal of the Heritage Awareness Month initiative to stop the generational perpetuation of children and families living apart, and yes, even isolation in our busy world today, which contributes to many social ills within homes, communities, and schools. So today, we welcome you to our 11th annual Parenting Awareness Month, Indiana Kickoff Breakfast. There are lots of activities going on during the month, and we will work out that activity. So I hope that you enjoy your breakfast. And at this particular time, I'd like to bring Gertie back so she can move us forward. Thank you for my We were expecting the mayor here. We'd like to do a proclamation. We just want to remind you that breakfast is still being served. If you came in late or if you want seconds, please feel free to help yourself at any time while the program still continues. Uh, first, we want to bring Jane Valenza forward. Now, Jane is that daughter that was a great friend and still is the great friend of Laura Smith, wise. And Jane is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Branding for the Indiana Parenting Institute. 
to when, I'm sorry, when you're a wise woman. <laughs> but Janae, we did this from birth. Janae is also very well known in Indianapolis to the degree that she is the newly appointed chairman for the Governor Eric Holcomb's Indiana Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. So we want to congratulate Janae on this day. I think of myself as that little girl, you know, who uh, used to play in the front playground and be shocked that I get to um, have responsibilities that make me important. But anyway, uh, let me read the proclamation. Whereas, whereas the most precious and valuable asset of our state is our children, and the future of our society depends largely on the emotional, social, physical, and intellectual growth of these most cherished individuals. And whereas we look to parents to protect and guide their children and inspire in them the importance of honesty, respect, education, empathy, service, and determination. And whereas parents nurture, love, and guide their children and help them develop into healthy, caring, loving, responsible, and contributing citizens. And whereas informed parenting adds stability and strength to the lives of children and helps reduce social and behavioral problems leading to child neglect, teen and non-marital pregnancy, school dropout, as well as alcohol, tobacco, drug misuse, violence, and crime. And whereas providing and promoting responsible parenting skills through education, mentoring, and available resources will greatly contribute to improved quality of life and will benefit future generations throughout the entire state. Now, therefore, I, Eric J. Holcomb, Governor of the State of Indiana, do hereby proclaim the month of April 2018 as Parenting Awareness Month, Indiana, in the state of Indiana, and invite all citizens to duly note this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. At this time, we want to recognize our sponsors. We have NIPSCO. First Midwest Bank, Ivy Tech Community College, Northwest City of Gary. We have the IBEW for the consistent support of providing IPA this uh, access to this beautiful venue. I'm so grateful to, to them for doing this today. So could we please give a hand to our speakers? Those who had to leave, such as Congressman Peter Biskowski, representing the first district of Indiana. He had a, another previous engagement, so he was here for a short while. Hopefully, you got to see him before he left. We have State Senator Eddie Melton. He stands here for the We have representatives from the United States Senator Joe Donnelly's office, Hobbs Patel, and Alexis Patel. Chicago, we have City Court Judge Tony Morris. We have with us our Lake County Court and candidate for Lake County Sheriff, Mark Brown. We have candidate for Lake County Sheriff, Richard Licken. We have Dr. Vanessa Allen McLeod from the Open League of Northwest Indiana. representing our Lake County Prosecutor Bernard Carter. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to our board members. We have Mr. James Wallace from Indiana University Northwest. Louis Gonzalez, Chancellor of Ivy Tech College Northwest. Attorney Thomas 
there. Crystal Melton. Achilleo McKellen. Uh, in his absence, Pastor Dolores Carter. In his absence, Lake County Prosecutor Bernard Carter. Myself, Burley Subs. And our board chair, Mark Rebus Raymond. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to have our entertainment, Courtney Dunn. She's a soloist, and she'll be singing The Greatest Love of All. Courtney. Children are future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they can set inside. Give them a chance. Make it easier. Let the children master. Remind us how we do. Everybody's searching for a hero. People need someone to look out to. I never found anyone to fulfill the need. I don't need that. Before I learned to take it, I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadow. If I tell, if I succeed, and think I live that my family says, no matter what they say, they can take away my dignity because of the way of the world. Yeah. 
At this time, I'd like to bring forward Jeanne Valenza, and she'll be introducing our keynote speaker for today's event. <laughs> Thank God for notes, huh? <laughs> this woman has done a lot, so I'm glad I have my little cheat sheet so I can share it with you. So Dr. Lori Salas has been an assistant professor at Butler University since 2016, where she teaches both undergraduate and graduate programs in their college of education. She founded the Educational Neuroscience Symposium, now in its seventh year, where educators, parents, and the community learn to implement the tools to help our students be successful, feel a sense of purpose and connection as they walk into their classrooms. Lori has been able to attract the foremost experts in the field of educational neuroscience for the symposium. So with trauma and, and adversity, growing the conference from 60 participants to over 400. Um, Lori's passion, <laughs> isn't it weird listening to someone talk about you? <laughs> Lori's passion is engaging her students through neuroscience as it applies to education by integrating mind-brain teaching. She also created the Applied Educational Neuroscience Certificate um, back in 2016, specifically designed to meet the needs of educators, counselors, and administrators who work beside children and adolescents who have and are experiencing adversity and trauma. Lori has conducted workshops throughout the United States and Dubai on my brain, teaching and learning. She also has authored a series of articles. You can find all of Lori's work presentation videos and her latest research on her website, www.revelationsandeducation.com. And now to the fun part, Lori resides in Indianapolis, Indiana with her hubby, Michael. <laughs> and she has three grown children, Andrew, Sarah, and Reagan. And so I'm going to be her clicker as well. So I'm trying to slide into getting her presentation up. But it is my pleasure to introduce you all to a wonderful, wonderful speaker. You're going to love what she has to talk about, Lord, Dr. Lori Salas. So I never have notes, but I, I was just so moved by the people I met this morning and just this topic. Um, we talk about the genius of every child and every adolescent. Really, that's the end product. And I'm here to, this morning to really share with you at the ground level what this is looking like as far as how adversity and trauma, and I want to talk about adversity because when we talk about trauma, sometimes we're thinking about something huge, you know, something like sexual abuse and physical abuse. But trauma is on a continuum. And before I begin delving into this, because an hour is like a short infomercial, I have so much to share with all of you this morning. I want to share with you that my work changed tremendously five years ago. And what I am going to talk to you about this morning happened at Arlington High School five years ago in February when the state had taken over five schools, one in Gary, four in Indianapolis. And I, at the time, was teaching at Marion University, and I was observing first and second year special education teachers. 
And at that time, I remember leaving Arlington and I got in my car and I remember putting my head on the steering wheel. I called our deeds and I said, Dr. Hill, I lost touch. I'm not walking the walk of K-12 teachers. I've got to get back in the classroom. I knew this research. I was teaching undergraduates and graduates. I'm a mom of three, and that's been a journey in itself. And I, I, I just said, what we do? Long story short, I said, I don't want a charter, and I didn't want a, a private school. I wanted to go back into a large, diverse public school. So Marion gave me one semester. They gave me a course release of three hours, and I went into Washington Township in Indianapolis. And at that time, I didn't know really what to expect, but I knew I wanted to co-teach two mornings a week. So the research, the strategies, these practices that I'm sharing with you today are the ones I have been using. What was one semester, one school has now turned into my 12th school. And now I'm in Indianapolis Public Schools two mornings a week at Butler's Lab School, IPS 60. But I want to share this with you. When Dr. Shelley invited me to Butler two years ago, almost two years ago, I was disappointed to go to the lab school. I'm going to be very transparent because I didn't, I felt the lab school had the support and had student teachers and had the resources that other IPS schools did not have. And I was very wrong. What I have learned in the past five years and beyond with my background being in special education, is that our new learning disability in this country is anxiety. Yes. And yes. we are seeing children and adolescents and all of us, adults, who are struggling with this, what I would call a new normal in our allostatic load, meaning our baselines have risen. So looking at some statistics and just sharing with you briefly, one third of all children and adolescents in our country, 27 to 33 percent of children and adolescents are walking into classrooms carrying in significant adversity. And what we know is you don't have to have a 504 or IEP for that. And so I am understanding very clearly how the stress response systems in our brains and bodies derail learning. We keep pushing cognition. We keep pushing testing. And what I am seeing everywhere I go is I am seeing children and adolescents that are walking in, shut down, apathetic, unmotivated, defensive. They are oppositional and they are aggressive little ones, five and six years old that I'm working with. I'm working at St. Mary's Childhood or Child, yeah, Child Center in Indianapolis. Three and four year olds are coming in so dysregulated. They are coming in rough. And this is contagious for our teachers, our social workers, our counselors, and our parents. Our parents are doing their best. We can all do better. We can all do better. So I got my teacher and I got my mom hat on this morning. And I'm going to share a little bit about what I mean by that. But I'm going to delve into something right now that I, 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 I'm learning constantly. And that is our stress response systems in our bodies. It's called the HPA axis. It develops through early childhood. It begins developing in utero through young adulthood just as our brains do. And I want you to turn to the person next to you, and I want you just to take a guess right now. What is the one main ingredient of the brain? What, what builds brain architecture? What develops the brain? Lots of things do, but what's the one main ingredient? I'm going to just give you seven seconds. Turn to the person next to you. So what I want to, and I have so much to share with you that um, if you said experiences, you are spot on. Experiences literally create circuits in the brain for learning, for behavior, for relationships, and our brains are social organs. So 
So I want to share this with you, and I'm learning this every day as a mom and as an educator. Attachment is the carrier of all development. Our children, many of our students, are coming in mistrusting adults. They are coming in, when I say dysregulated, or when I say rough, there are oftentimes children and adolescents walking in, and I've seen this daily, who have not formed healthy connections with a the caregiver. They don't have brain architecture. Regulation issues are behavioral issues. Behavioral issues are regulation issues, which are physiological issues. So there is not this brain development in the areas of the brain that empathize, that build on resilience, that have emotional regulation or sustained attention or cognition or working memory. So I'm gonna share with you this morning that this work I'm talking about, Applied Educational Neuroscience, Brain and Adversity, is not a program. And everywhere I speak across the country, I keep saying, school systems spend thousands of dollars on programs, and they're good ones, but they come and go, and they recycle. And this is a framework, it's a discipline for how we sit beside our children and adolescents in relationship and in learning, in connection, in relationship, in cognition. So when we look at educational neuroscience, and um, this is, I, I wanted to share this with you, and I've had 45 slides, and they are all yours. I will get through maybe three. If I don't have a clicker and this is a new PowerPoint, I don't know where the hell I'm going this morning. <laughs> so I'm just going to be very transparent. So let's just begin with a little neuroplasticity this morning. I want you, this is too much, by the way, talking at someone while you're sitting on your behind is about the best way to learn, or worst way to learn anything. So go ahead and stand up right now. You've been sitting a while. Stand up. So we're going to do something. I don't think anyone on a Friday morning or Good Friday has ever asked you to do this. So we're going to create a new circuit in your brain right now. Literally, I'm going to ask you to do something. And so just watch this just for a second. I want you to make a peace sign and an okay sign. And as quickly as you can, I want you to switch and go back and forth. Back and forth. <laughs> it's okay if this is if this is a little challenging that's because it should be now that was too if that was too easy service teachers to teach because what we know is that you can all have a seat. Thank you. <laughs> what we know is that neuroplasticity is for real. And Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor talks about the new, the three new areas in educational neuroscience or neuroscience. One is neuroplasticity. And what that means is that's hopefulness. Our experiences, every single experience we encounter moment by moment, structurally and functionally changes brain architecture. And we are teaching this to my sixth and seventh graders. I, they, IPS has been on spring break the last two weeks. So when I go back on Tuesday morning, we are going to have a couple of great intervals. We're going to warm up and we are going to use neuroplasticity because they know exactly what it is. And they are using hope. I mean, we're looking at homework. We're looking at different personal habits that they can change up, knowing that you don't have to be the victim of your circumstances. You don't have to. And this is what's so exciting about this discipline is because this is the number one strategy. We are teaching children about their neuroanatomy. We are sharing a common language. We are taking discipline and turning it into a science. And children are feeling empowered. Adolescents are feeling empowered because they know that with repetition, and, and, and they, they also know, I brought this to show you today. So 
This was, um, what do you think this is? Yeah, so this is, this is learning right here. This is, this is the Dean of, uh, Dr. Shelley gave this to me um, for Christmas. And so we are, to, they, the students know that we learn through repetition and make circuits in the brain, whether those are habits that come from being in a fight, flight, freeze response or their cognitive habits. So let me share with you this right now. I want you to put your hands on your forehead. What part of the brain is this? Shout out. Um, so this is the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex. This is developing. About 25 to 30. So we've been told, 20, yeah, somebody said that, 30? Absolutely. So it's gone up because we are raising a different student population. This finishes developing in late or late 20s to early 30s. And what we know is this, this, this is the part of the brain right here where we do life and where we do school. It holds what we call those executive functions, sustained attention, emotional regulation, problem solving. And now I want you to make two ovals and put them above each ear. <coughs> right here above each ear. Deep in the limbic system in the temporal lobe of each brain is the amygdala. And this is our fight, flight, freeze response. And what we know is when that amygdala is activated, when that amygdala is firing, Everything here goes offline. We don't have an oxygenated glucose blood flow to the frontal lobe. And I want to shout this to the world because our children, many of our children and adolescents and our educators are coming in with, there's nothing happening here. You all know that. When you are stressed, how clearly do you think? When you are feeling that negative emotion, you are dysregulated and you're not thinking very clearly. And what we are seeing is children coming in, carrying in adversity, carrying in what we call family responsibilities they should never have at the ages they have sometimes. And we, those, there's a term, young carers. So adversity happens on a continuum. And I want to share that lack of sleep raises cortisol levels in the brain and body. How many of us know children and adolescents who are not getting the sleep they need? It is stressful. It changes the way your brain fires and wires. Lack of good nutritious food is raises cortisol and adrenaline levels. Having, having some adversity as far as pre-memory. Let me share this with you, and this is huge for us to know as a community. The greatest time, the most vulnerable time of brain change is in utero through the first year of life. And it happens in utero. And what we know is that in that first year of life, that right hemisphere comes on board before the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere, we are not left to right brain. That is a neuro myth. But the, I, so I, I don't want anyone thinking that I'm saying that if I see because I fight neuro myths all the time. But the right hemisphere comes on board and it holds emotion, it holds visual imagery and implicit memory. So when a four-month-old has gone through significant neglect, and you think, well, they're not going to remember that. If they've been adopted into a healthy environment, that's not going to matter. It matters because experiences stick to the brain like Velcro in that first year of life. And even if you don't have the words, even if you don't have the conscious declarative memory of that, it still is there and attaches to the brain and body. Adversity changes our cells, it changes our DNA, and it changes our biology. And I am looking at education right now through a very different lens because traditional discipline works the best for the children who need it the least. And we have got to begin to look at a brain-aligned discipline for this state and for the country because what is happening is our children who are coming in rough when we punish them in punitive ways, it actually elevates their stress response system. Yes. Yes, I absolutely will. It is on my, I think it's on my slide. I'm so sorry. You'll have the whole thing. But traditional discipline 
works the best with the children who need it the least. I'm sorry, I did say that so quickly. So we are looking at regulation first. So this is this is what, and this is the work we're doing, and I can't tell you how exciting this is. Teachers, social workers, counselors, parents, everything I'm talking about today, I wish I had known as a young mom. Because these are, and I'll share with you, you'll hear about Andrew, our oldest son, just briefly, and he owes me this after being his mother for 26 years. <laughs> Honest to God. So um, we, I will be sharing um, with you about him in a minute. We, we have to laugh sometimes. But we need to begin to meet our children to get to that genius. We've got to meet them where they are, not in academics, but in brain development. In brain development. We have 15-year-olds walking in who are being suspended and expelled for these infractions. And if you look at their, if you look at their behaviors, they look six and seven years old. Guess what? The research says they are. Emotionally, they are. Let me share this with you. In that first year of life, when attachment means more than anything, when a baby cries, the stress system is activated. When a mom picks up that baby and rocks or holds that baby, the parasympathetic nervous system comes on, so the heart rate lowers, the blood pressure lowers, respiration lowers. So every time a child cries or is hungry or is in pain, and then that child is regulated by another adult, then there is a nice balance. It's a homeostasis balance. And then the child learns how to regulate on their own. So what I am doing with middle schoolers, and I will be doing this this week, I've got activities planned, and this is called priming the brain for learning. This is where we get cognition. This is where we raise test scores. When we begin to get that brain ready to learn by coming at the brain stem and the limbic areas where there's inflammation. So what I'm saying is we've got kids coming in. One of my third graders at Greenbrier Elementary, she was a little girl. I was Greenbrier in Washington Township, and I was there for a semester. I had 26 students. Eight of those students had parents incarcerated that semester. And she came in so rough every day and just so dysregulated. And we were teaching her about her amygdala. And by the way, children love to say the word amygdala. My little ones say, it sounds so good in my mouth, amygdala. And she said, Dr. Lori, does this mean that my brain is swollen, or my, limbic, my amygdala is swollen? And I thought, what a great analogy. I said, you've got a little bruise on there, but it's going to heal. You know, we're going to help you. We're going to all do this together. Because these strategies that we're implementing in the classrooms are good for all students. And this is about my brain state. This is about our brain state. Emotions are contagious. You all know that. And how often can we get dysregulated just when we're around someone who is dysregulated? And as an educator, I, I share, I mean, I'm doing, the, I, I'm in school systems everywhere, but my first thing that I'm sharing is your teacher brain state matters. You gotta take care of you. Because if you're going in there with that cup almost empty, you, are, you have nothing left. So this is about your well-being. This is about our well-being as parents. Stand up. This is too much talking again. So go ahead and stand up. So what I, what I want you to do is um, I want you to make a uh, I want you to make a wave vertical. So I'll get up here so you can see. So make this, just take one of your arms and just go up and down. So you're making a wave that's your vertical. Now take that's good. Right, that's what you got. It. Now take the other arm and go back and forth. So you're going towards the other. Now put it together and keep going in the
for us to learn something really well, to make a circuit. We ask our children and our adolescents, what circuit did you come in with today? In our community morning meetings, we literally say, are you running an anxious circuit? Do you have a worried circuit? Do you have a sad circuit? What circuit are you running? Because they know about neuronal connections. They know that the more they think something, the more they feel something, the more they do something, they are actually creating a hardwired circuit. And so we, I, I want you to think about these strategies that I'm going to share in a minute as procedures. As a parent, as a teacher, as an administrator, or even as a CEO or COO of my business, when I'm sitting beside the people that I work beside, I need to make sure that everyone is feeling felt. And this is something that is just critical about the genius in every child. When we don't feel a sense of connection or we don't feel heard or seen, and many of our kids coming to school, school's in adversity. Because how, who likes to go to school seven hours a day and, and, and that's something you're not very good at? because you don't learn math or language. Your area of expertise might be music. Your area of expertise might be nature. Your area of expertise might be talking, which is not, which that doesn't bode well. So when we talk about these strategies, I'm gonna share something with you right now, and I want you to turn to the person, just guess what this is. Now, I shared with you this morning about how our stress response, we have a couple of different stress response systems, but I'm not going to get into those. You don't need to know those this morning. They're in the PowerPoint, though. But what I want to share with you is there's a rule called the 90-second rule. Now, turn to the person next to you. What in the heck is that? Just guess. What is that? <laughs> today so you can there are no wrong answers you might want to guess the 90 second rule yeah. I love that that's part of it how long it takes for something to move into long-term memory I love that what else what another guess yes say that again to respond yes part of it yeah connection you're all yeah I heard that. Now, I, I think that's part of it too. So let me share with you what this is. The night you and you got to share this. If I'm going to leave you with a few straps, the 90 second rule says that our bodies and brains rinse clear and clean of negative emotion in 90 seconds on their own. So why do we stay so shitty with each other for days and weeks and months? Why do we do that? We do that. Why do we do that? You all are dreading already next Christmas to be with you know who. We are sharing this with our students, so let me share with you that when we create these practices, that prime the brain. These are evidence-based, research-based neuroscience practices that we're, and I'm gonna share what those are in just a minute. But I gotta give you the why first. That when we when we know our bodies and brains have this beautiful complex intelligence, we can do this. Kids are like, wow, because you know what? Every time you tell somebody you're not gonna believe what happened to me, it's not even the truth anymore. You distort it every time you tell it. So you know, this is, so we have schools that have the 90 second rule banner up. And, and so we have practices, and I'm gonna tell you, in Indiana right now, if you use the word meditation in the school, 
people still look at you like they have ten sets of eyes. But I want to share with you that we are we have renamed that because meditation is about focused attention. If you can't pay attention and your mind is constantly in that fight, fight, frozen and respond, if you are constantly protecting and defending and looking at everything as a threat, you don't have attention, and therefore you're not going to be learning. And we see brilliant, genius children, three and four years academically behind in school, not because they are not right. They are brilliant. It's because that stress response system has hijacked learning. It literally derails our ability to think clearly. And so, when I say we're meeting children and adolescents in brain development, let me share with you what that looks like. We're teaching them their neuroanatomy, and they know about the structure up here. I finally found my slide. This, and my two daughters say, Mom, take that off. That is so gross. And I say, it's real, so I like it. This is the hippocampus, and it sits next to the amygdala in the limbic system. And in this area is where we have, the hippocampus is an area where we have emotional, visual, spatial memory, and it also affects our mood and learning. And I want to share with you something that is very challenging for us today as a society, and we need to know this as parents and as teachers and as, as a community. The hippocampus is the CEO of our stress response system. It is supposed to turn that cortisol and that adrenaline off. But we are seeing this area of the brain damaged in children as young as four and five years old because of unpredictable early stress. And so we are seeing cell death. The dendrites in this area of the brain can't take the onslaught of cortisol. It's just like drug or alcohol addiction. You know, that reward center in the brain with addiction, those receptors on that cell, when so much dopamine is being secreted, those receptors can't take it. And that's what's happening in learning in this area of the brain. Now, the good news is, is that there is neuroplasticity. The brain also is capable of neurogenesis, which is building and creating new neuro, neuronal connections and neurons. So... We have the biology of stress and we have the biology of hope. And this is what I want to share with you right now. We've got to meet some of our kids in their brain stem. You don't build a house starting on the second floor and that's what we are doing in this country. We are pushing cognition and we just are spinning. I mean, I've been in education 28 years and it all recycles. And, and so I want to say this is where the rubber meets the road. I have got to meet Jamarian, and I've got to meet Michelle if they're walking in dysregulated and they don't even have words. Because let me ask you this. How many of us, when we've been told to calm down, have ever calmed down? It doesn't work. And in school, we're all about words and language. But I want to share with you that we are meeting. So here, this is so cool. If your brain is built from the brain stem to the front, back to the frontal lobe, and from the inside out. So the brain stem area is the seat of sensory and motor activity. So the language back here, I have to meet kids in this area. The language of the brain stem is sensation. So I want you to take a pen out right now and a piece of paper, you know, just a scrap piece of paper. And I'm going to have you do this. I'm going to name some sensations. And a sensation is much easier to name for a child or an adolescent than it is a feeling. Some kids just don't know how they're feeling. But we can name a sensation. And if, I, if you felt this sensation in your body or brain this week, just jot it down. You ready? Tense. Tight. Fuzzy, numb, tingly, butterfly. We made that one up in class. 
We make this one up too, goose bumpy ish. Soft, teary, flowy, closed. Okay, can we laugh just for a minute? So we, I had one word on there, but I've taken it off. Don't be share the word hard when you have fifth grade boys. <laughs> Don't, do Don't do it with freshmen either. We did that in my undergraduate class. They were worse than the 10 year olds. Now, what we know is that what's made, what is shareable is bearable, and what you can make you contain. So we are taking procedures like having students come in and they are grabbing a sensation off the sensation word wall list and they're coloring it, they're writing it, and they're giving it shape. So if you wrote a sensation down, don't, I want you to draw it. Does it have straight lines? Is it big? Is it curvy? Just draw. Whatever comes to your mind, you have seven seconds. If there's a sensation, just draw it. So what does stiff look like? What does warm look like? Gooey is a sensation. The language of the brainstem is sensation. And we are helping our children and our adolescents. I have, we had, I have so, it's been the day together today, and I could show you a documentary of a young man named Will who is carrying into school probably seven or eight ACEs. How many of you are familiar with the ACE study? All right, this is something that I, I'm going to share right now. How, what time? I do time. But, okay, okay. So here's what I want to share with you. The language of the brain stem is sensation. I'm going to get to the study. The language of the limbic system is feelings. And then finally, the language of the cortex is words. And what we are using as parents and as educators is we are using a lot of talk. And when any of us are in that fight, flight, freeze response. The left prefrontal cortex, where broke is area, that's our expressive language area, that, that shuts down. It goes offline. We don't hear words. I wish I had known that with Andrew. I mean, when I think, you know, when I think about the power of that, so we are using, have, have you all seen the movie Inside Out? It came out in 2015. It is not a child's movie. It is an adult movie. And I write for, is anyone familiar with Edutopia? So I write for them. And I wrote a five-part series for educators, for parents, for anybody who's working because kids love this film. Teenagers love this film and they get it. This is headquarters. And this is where all the feelings, you know, we're living. And we know that emotions are contagious. So when we look at children, who are coming into our schools, and let me explain what this ACE study is, and I wish I could show you the documentary. Adverse childhood experience experiences. The study was done 22 years ago. It's the largest public health study that has ever been done in our country. 17 and a half thousand adults were given a survey looking at their childhood adversities. And they had a, an indicator list of 10. We've added some of those adversities on. The, there have been hundreds of studies since this original one with Dr. Felipe and the CDC. But what I want to share with you, let me just name some of these adversities. And I want to share this with you too. There isn't a person in this room this morning that doesn't have a few aces. I gave this to my husband last summer as I was taking a deeper dive look into this. And I said, Michael, look at this. Could you, would you take this for me? He had six out of 10 aces. I knew his childhood had been challenging. And I knew parts. But let me share this with you. Let me give you some of these aces. Social rejection and social rejection and humiliation is an ace. Growing up with a caregiver who has experienced mental illness or emotional duress is an ace. Growing up in a family where drug addiction or alcoholism has been present is an ace. Growing up with parents who have separated or become divorced, that's an ace. P 
poverty is an ace. We are at about a 26% poverty level right now in our country. Now, I the, the report is about 22, 23%. I think that's very conservative. We also know domestic violence is obviously an ace, sexual abuse, physical abuse, but I want to share with you neglect because neglect is very, very serious and it happens across all socioeconomic, as was mentioned before I talked, all racial, all ethnicities. Neglect is when the brain is not getting the instructions and the directions it needs to develop. And this is where we've got, this is where educators can make a difference. I, when we can connect with a child, and stay connected through the conflict, to really stay connected, because it's so easy to parent or to teach a well-behaved child. But our, many of our children are coming in so rough that that emotional contagion is high, and we get triggered. And I want to share this with you. Your ACE score and the ACEs you carry in can subconsciously be triggers for you. Dr. Nick Long identified what he called middle class triggers. And I want to, I just want to share a couple with you right now. Be honest, because self-reflection is critical to all of our well-being. How many of you, let me just share a couple. How many of you get triggered if things look disorganized in your home or your work? Things are just a mess. It really messes with your head. You, you have to have, you have to have order. That is a trigger. How many of you get triggered when people are late? Yeah, that's something you value. Yeah, so for our teachers, when we go through this, like I'm training the Indianapolis Public Schools. I've got 23 schools, just a cohort group. And so we've been talking about these kids who come in late. You know, you're just, you're testy. You know, it just irritates you. How many of you get triggered when someone looks lazy? You're thinking, come on, I've done this, I've been through that, I've had harder moments than this, and I made it. That's that survivor pride. And so what we know is that we see movement, we see a brain beginning to flourish when we meet a child where they are in brain development. And then comes that beautiful genius, that cognition. Yes. I want to bring it back. Yeah. So that is, and actually, um, what is the wonderful educator that did the TED Talk? That talked about and she had it's called mama's law have you all seen that oh I so wish I could show that I don't have internet I don't think this morning okay so back to your question that's a great question so what we are seeing is so that he said what do you do with kids who yes they get talked to they're getting ready to fight you think you better be everyone goes on their peaceful way and then after school they're at it. you know or they are in hallway D in front of room 222 they're at it because what we're getting, and, and I'm seeing this, I mean, I'm feeling, I'm living it. What we're getting is compliance and obedience. We're not getting a behavioral shift. There's no buy-in there. And so buy-in comes from these strategies. Buy-in comes from when, you, when someone feels heard and seen, when someone gets choices, when we offer a compromise, when we look at discipline in an organic way. So listen to this. I'm so excited about this. Did, did, did that answer your question? I'm going to give, was that? Yeah, it, it, it did. What I'm going to say is that you are giving us a that is important about a child and a voice not talk as a kid, but to really listen. Maybe work with them and become one of the most important to work out of investment. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Voice and choice are huge, but I, I, I want to share, oh gosh, I was going to share something really important. Um, what was I just talking about? 
So when we look at these strat, oh, I know what I'm going to tell you. We, okay, so think about this. My work now is I'm working with Warsaw School District and Washington Township, and we're working with bus drivers because bus drivers yeah. are our first responders. They are they the environment that we don't see. They have relationships we'll never have in a school. And so when we talk about regulation, we're giving bus drivers these strategies. It's a hand signal. You know, it's like a check-in, um, they have a celebration bucket, so they share on Friday. Oh, bus drivers have a couple of minutes. I mean, they're I was I was at a I was in Dallas, Texas two weeks ago at a bus driver's conference. I never thought I'd find myself there. And she's in a district with a hundred percent free and reduced lunch. The demographics are are tough. She was told by her principal that she had six kindergarten students and their classification was developmentally delayed. She got there in August. She was three weeks late with, when they finally got there. They, they couldn't get there, and they got a sub for her. And I've been down there twice. I'm actually writing. Michael McKnight and I are writing our next book. And we just came back spending time in Sarah's class. And I can tell you that those six boys are eight years old and nine years old, and they are brilliant, genius children. But they are functioning at a kindergarten pre-K level not because they're not smart, but because these children are walking in with four and five and six and seven and eight aces. They have a different nervous system. Their brains, it's, it's their physiology, it's not about their behavior. These children are doing the best they can, but the brain's number one role is to survive. That's why we have a brain. And many of our kids are coming in paying attention to everything that feels threatening, unfamiliar, and unsafe. And learning is the last thing, is the last thing on their mind. A look in the hallway, a look by the lockers, something that happened the night before, something that was said at breakfast. Trauma and adversity is held in fragments in the right hemisphere. It's held through visual images. It's held in places and in the body that we're not aware of. I'm working with a family in Indianapolis right now who adopted Chandler when he was six years old. He's now 13, they've had him seven years. They called me when I was at Marion to be their advocate. They are his 14th home. And this young boy, his behavior in school was off the charts. I mean, he was aggressive and violent. But what they didn't know is that he was getting triggered by so many books they, and that they were reading in class, by movies they were showing, even a white van driving across the parking lot would trigger him because of past experiences and what happened in the white van he was in. So we don't, we can't know what all those aces are, but I know this. I can say to a child, Every child, when they come in, I can give a child in a class of 30, 30 seconds. And I can say to them, I am here for you today. I am here to take care. I am working for you today. And maybe I can't talk to you right now. This is, this is, where, this is where this becomes the procedure. But I will, I will be there with you. So I'm going to end today with, am I still okay on talking? How what? Five? Yeah, yeah. I do. So that's a great question. And um, I want to share when I talk about rough, that's kind of what I'm seeing. So that's dysregulation. That's a child who's coming in impulsive who's coming in a hyperactive, who's coming in in a hyper-aroused state, kind of hyper-vigilant, kind of just jumpy, paying attention to everything, not able to just be calm, you know, not able to focus. So the opposite of that would be a focus-centered brain state. So a rough brain state would be just that child coming in in that way. Um, I, I want, yes, I think I should just stop. It, I, I'll stop. And um, and then I've got two books to give away because I want to answer your questions. So yeah. Talk about that. Um, 
stress response. So we're using movement and breath, and you'll see in the PowerPoint, and I'll share this with everybody, um, these are strategies that, that I've created that are regulation strategies. And again, it's a process, nothing changes overnight. So, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just, it's not happening fast enough for me. I mean, this is, we've got, there, there's no blame here. Our teachers need support. Our teachers are drowning in anxiety. And they're being asked to do something they weren't prepared to do. I mean, we were teaching. You know, we weren't prepared to be kit in brain development. So we, I mean, I we are doing this training. And again, I don't even like to use the word, I don't even like the word training. But, but working beside districts, that's where we've got to begin doing this. We've got to begin it to prepare teachers. I want to share this with you. Butler University, we've created an educational neuroscience certification in brain and trauma. And next year, this is exciting, in the summer of 2019, it's three three-hour courses. It's a certification. It could be a part of your master's work. Your, it, I don't care if you've got four doctorates. Come take it. Um, it is nine hours. And next summer, it's going to be a hybrid course. I've had people wanting this, and so right now it's face-to-face. -face, but starting next summer, we're going to meet for one week in June, and then the fall and spring courses are going to be online with me. And it, it's a way that we can literally at least begin this process as I travel to districts and try to get this out there. Yes? Earlier, you talked about you wish that every student in school uh, had a DC school. So I'm asking you a specific what would the school be able to do? How would they be able to take that to talk about yeah. implement the way that you would do it? Well, we would have to, we would have to prepare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the training for that. And it's not important to know what those cases are. That's dangerous. You know, I just I think we begin to look at the numbers. You know, we begin to look at, all right, this kid who's coming in with four, you know, is going to have a lot different academic and behavioral profile than this child coming in with one week. You know, so, and if you think about, I want to say this, think about the, you know, think of this educational neuroscience is right here. It's the spot basement. And then you've got these pillars, and the pillars are social emotional learning, PBIS. Mm -hmm. um, academic, um, restorative justice. You know what I mean? So the brain science informs all of this. So, yeah. You mentioned earlier that during the time frame of when the state took over in the school, I worked at one of the schools at Fort Polk. We gave a survey to our students. 51% of the students there said, there was an adult that they could trust in the school that they could trust. What scared me was 49% said that there was not one out of all the adults in there, and not one adult they could trust if they were in crisis or in a state of emergency. And I took that information because I've lived in public housing for 20 years, so I've seen some of it. And we had an incident where a young man was killed in a drive-by. His body was 
that's what I'm talking about. Next morning, I called our district, because our district does have an extra very school corporation. There's an extra in the price of prices. When there's a price rate that you call, they immediately send counselors out. Immediately, that's what I did because I knew those children seeing that they could look out the window and see the body, and then they have to go to school and round the same way. Thankfully, one of the students was the cousin of the boy. Thank you. You know, and, and this is, thank you for sharing that. And how do you teach a service area and persuasive paragraphs when our children are contending with it? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So thank you. I I want to end. Oh, I found that question. Yeah. I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. Yes. Yes. And this is about the And I was just wondering, like, at this point, if, if there are other children who are that, uh, that you can hand a book to a teacher, and there will be, you know, something, if you can have some of the children from the middle school, so it's allowed and it's important to so not to do it. And that's a great question. And so, on both sides of that coin, we want a fix. You know, we want a recipe. And it's been hard for me to try to put this into, you know, like a curriculum to defend, just because it's not, you know, because it has a thousand bases. Yeah, it's about connection. It's about connection. <coughs> but over Christmas, um, over the holidays, I wrote a scope and sequence that I would love to give to this group today. It's a living document. It's not finished. So just know it. I'm going to say that word again. It's a little messy. Um, but <coughs> And it literally has, because I, when I leave a district, when I leave a city, um, Lori, this is great, but now what? What do I do with this? And so it has the topic, and it has the strategies, and it has its sourced. So at least now, um, it, when you see this, it's going to say 45 days. When we, I had to laugh, when we giggled, it, or when I looked at this, it's enough for a year-long curriculum. So that's what we've got. I'm done, right? Thank you all so much. Let's get Dr. Lori Nissa tells us seven rounds of applause. moment we noticed that um, Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson from the city of Gary is here and we do have a couple of remarks from Senator Joe Donnelly. So first I'm going to ask Todd Patel to come forward and give those remarks from the Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As a father of three young children and one on the way and I plan to use some of these techniques and to share it with folks as well. So thanks again for your, for your wonderful remarks. Thank you to all of you on behalf of Senator Donnelly for being here. You're the foundation uh, for the success, not only of our children, but of our families and our communities, regardless of whether you're the parent to a child, a neighbor to a child, or someone who attends church with a child that's struggling or needs assistance. The Senator has worked on some uh, policy issues, and uh, it's called the Foundation for Families agenda, and it works on several different areas. Paid family medical leave. It also has issues with, uh, focuses on early childhood education, uh, Head Start being one that's critical, and then also there's other programs out there, TRIO programs, uh, Project Upward Bound, if you're familiar with that, to get uh, first generation students the opportunity for success uh, to go to college, uh, and to have other opportunities. And I'm not necessarily referring to a four-year college. It could be just a technical certificate. And I know the, uh, we had someone from Ivy Tech here as well. The other areas that he's focused on are early childhood with pre-K, making sure that we expand that here in Indiana. 
higher education accessibility, but also part of that is to make sure that uh, individuals who are getting student loans uh, know what their obligation is, and that every semester the university informs that individual who's getting an education what their financial obligation is uh, so that they can take care of that. And the last piece to this is pay equity, to make sure that men and women are both being paid equally. Amen. And in the national <laughs> women make 80% of what men make. In Indiana, that number is 76%. And so Senator Donnelly's focus is to make sure that we're 100% for women and we're 100% for men. Uh, and, uh, so those are a few things that he's working on uh, to focus on uh, families here in Indiana and families nationally. So with that, thank you very much for this. What the senator's working on. Opportunity to meet Laura Wynn uh, and uh, talk about the work that she wanted to do on behalf of parents and children. And uh, a little while thereafter, I met her daughter, Janae, and you all have been doing this work for a long, long time, and our communities are better for it. So I want to take this opportunity to congratulate you. But we know that um, as hard as we work on behalf of our children, that unless they have parents and adults in their lives, then much of our work, while not in vain, it won't be as productive as we would like them or the work to be. Ultimately, what our objective is, is to create resiliency. Because we know that resilient children and resilient families make resilient communities. And so today, it's my honor to provide a proclamation on behalf of the city and citizens of Gary, Indiana. And it is in recognition of Parenting Awareness Month. It simply says that whereas the Indiana Parenting Institute Incorporated engages businesses, schools, churches, organizations, and state and local agencies, in coming together to acknowledge the vital role parents perform in raising children to reach their full potential to become productive citizens of our communities. And whereas Parenting Awareness Month in the end exists to educate and engage parents and communities in celebrating people raising children and to promote awareness of the need for effective and responsible <laughs> parent education to eradicate poverty, grow vibrant communities, and equip children with sustainable life skills to lead future generations. And whereas Parenting Awareness Month Indiana advocates for giving kids a safe place to live and play, and to help children to express their feelings and work hard to ensure that children are taught responsibility and ask for help when needed. Now, therefore, I, Karen Freeman Wilson, Mayor of Gary, Indiana, do proclaim April 2018 to be Parenting Awareness Month, Indiana. And it works in Maryville, too. So, thank you. This 29th day. Of March, uh, 
30th day of March, 2018. Thank you. At this time, we're going to go into our awards and presentations. Parenting Month, Awareness Month, Indiana, celebrates people, raises children, uh, calls attention to the needs for effective and responsible parenting through education and training to keep children safe and families together. Each year, PAMI recognizes parents who've shown significant determination and commitment to acquire and to apply effective and responsible parenting skills to empower and to advance the well-being of their families. This year, we're pleased to honor and celebrate the achievement of three IPI families. Kevin and Sharon Banks, Alberto and Rosemary Muniz, and Raymond Cross. Awards are being presented by their family life coach, educator, Rosemary Garbaski and Ashley Palmer. So they come forward and tell us a little bit about these families and present their awards at this time. Good morning or afternoon. How are you today? Um, my name is Ashley Comer and I serve as parent educator for the Indiana Parent Teacher um, And I'm super and honored to stand before you to, to present this award. I remember um, the unit of the class, the first day it started. It was my first teaching group. I had about seven parents in that group. And over the corner was a couple. Um, they were so cute. And I completely admired them um, because she was listening to sweet nothings in her ear during class. And I could not figure out what they were talking about in her ear. Um, but Mrs. Munez brought so much positivity and wisdom to our group. Oftentimes, I have a lot of young parents, and sometimes, as being a young person myself, it's hard to um, teach older people some, some of those great parent um, parental wisdom. But Ms. Nunez, she always had my back, and I uh, and I definitely appreciate you for that. Um, I know going through the program is hard because of the homework and all the commitment and dedication that it took having my family and things like that, and especially going going through all of the work. But I just want to thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for all the lessons that, that you taught me, um, especially the ones that were taught in graduate school or the lessons that I didn't learn in the book. Um, you received all the expectations. So, Ms. Newman, without further ado. <laughs> IPI presents this parent recognition award to you and to your husband um, for your persistent determination to improve the quality and content of family relationships within your home by successful completing and continual applying the principles of family behavior management to empower, protect, and stabilize the well being. Presented Hi, everybody. My name is Rose Marie, and I work with the 
parenting educators at the Deanna Parenting Institute. Unfortunately, the parents that I requested to get awarded are not here. And so what I'm going to do is read their testimonials and go their presence. The first person that I'm going to read it from is his name is Raymond, and he was court he was court mandated to come to parenting classes. He wore an ankle bracelet to class, and he came very intimidated. And this is how he left. I have really enjoyed the classes here. The ability to open up and actually ask questions about things that bother us. The environment is very welcoming and the staff is very helpful. Good job. I would actually like the ability to keep coming to classes here to continue to learn to be a better parent and to better myself. <laughs> the next parent that I want to talk about is DCS Reaper. His daughter was a habitual drug addict, and he raised his sister's children, and now he's raising his grandchildren, and he ended up in DCS. It was great to meet some nice people, and we have another family. All, see, also heard a lot that I didn't know, and it did help me talk to my kids, and I love the teacher. She was a great teacher, and I learned how to appreciate my kids more and use it to talk to my grandkids, so I thank you. <laughs> this man was six foot two, and he cried along with the other mothers in the class. We all have emotional garbage, and these people just let it go in my class, and I'm so thankful for them. So this is a lot on the program. But one of the things that I want to just I said to the person who took this first for being the best. Oh.
And I just have one more thing to say. They spelled my name correctly. <laughs> Oh man, are you doing the next for, are you doing more? Oh, awesome. Here you go. Thank you for my I know you guys have been sitting for a long time and I don't have any <laughs> So I'm just gonna get right to it, but oh my goodness. I really am. You're awesome. Um, the Indiana Parenting Institute Civic Leadership Award honor individuals and organizations, change makers in our community, doing extraordinary work to support and address the most pressing challenges facing Hoosier children, families, and communities. To keep children safe and families together is our main objective. The individuals and organizations chosen today are in no way strangers to us. Their work is making a difference and their names are ever present in some positive way in our community. It is an honor to recognize these individuals and agencies and to let them know that we support them. We see your work, we see your willingness to give, to support, to inform, and to lead in making our community and state a better place for all. It is our privilege to introduce these forever present leaders in our community, shall we? Um, first is Anthony Cherry, principal of 21st Century Charter School. <laughs> Civic Leadership Award. I would study for this, but it was just given to me, so forgive me. Anthony Cherry is somewhat of a renegade. He noticed that his students were struggling with issues that put them on the brink of not just suspension, but failure. He sought a solution that would not exasperate the problem, but would rather allow his students to continue in school. So what did he do? He reached out to his community for help and for a solution that would help both the students and their parents. And that is how we meet. We met him. He was seeking the means to provide both parents and students the opportunity to forgo suspension by instead having the parent attend family behavioral management workshops after school and to learn more productive ways of addressing not only the problem of suspension, but also build stronger family relationships that keep kids in school. Did, did he find it? Yes, he did. He did it and it worked. Next is, so I'm Spanish, and at this point I would say, ay Dios mío, que pasó. Our next awardee, is Albert Gay. Excellent in community service. How many of you actually know that Albert Gay is also an ordained minister? Albert, who serves on and sits in leadership of numerous committees throughout Indiana. We'll name just a few. He's the acting director of the Gary Neighborhood Services. He's a long term member of Coffee Youth Program. He's the chair of SAFE substance abuse. He travels around teaching professionals on the importance of cultural diversity in the workplace. He mentors youth in organizations like Urban Scouting and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Northwest Indiana. He works with a number of coalitions in Northwest Indiana. 
He's a certified mental health first aid and youth mental health first aid instructor. He's a, well, he does have a regular job besides all this, as the education and training specialist and research associate at the Indiana University's Indiana Prevention Resource Center. Albert has worked in community organizing and substance use prevention for over 20 years. His areas of training, research, and development are concentrated in substance abuse prevention, strategic planning, and coalition organizational development. Albert is a professional, totally committed to societal health disparities, social justice, cultural competence, historical trauma, and faith-based initiatives. Albert does have another passion, and we understand it's Star Wars and Prince. <laughs> But to say all of this about Albert, we want you to know that he is the person in the community who will build your bridge. Now this bridge will help to get you to the other side, but he's more than likely to equip you with the skills and tools to build your own bridge so you can help others get to the other side. Congratulations. Our next award is for civic leadership. And this award is uh, geared to philanthropy. And NIFSCO is the recipient of this award. Accepting the award for NIFSCO is Senator Eddie Melton. <laughs> NIFSCO is a leading philanthropic company consistently supporting organizations working to make a difference in communities throughout Northwest Indiana. For its charitable donations, event sponsorships, volunteerism, and covering areas of community vitality and development, environmental and energy sustainability, learning and science education, and public safety and human services. Indiana Parenting Institute is honored to present this annual philanthropic civic leadership award to NIPSCO for its demonstrated commitment to making a difference in the lives of people and the communities it serves. Our next award is, the Indiana, is for the Indiana Department of Veteran Affairs for Culture and Excellence Award. Accepting the award. All right, so this one, Matthew Vincent, uh, uh, he is the Deputy Director of Indiana Department of Veteran Affairs. Mr. Mike Brown was not with us today. Uh, since its establishment in 19, no, I'm sorry, but Mr. Mike Brown is not. I'm sorry, Mr. Jim Brown as well. I'm sorry. He's going to do it all. Thank you. I was going to say both of you. I'm sorry. Since its establishment in 1945, the Indiana Department of Veterans Affairs has remained focused on aiding and assisting closure veterans and their qualified family members or survivors who are eligible for benefits or advantages provided by the state of Indiana and the U.S. government. Indiana Parenting Institute is honored to acknowledge and recognize their work which includes several programs and services, providing our military servicemen and women and their families with the help and support they need as they seek to reconnect with family, reacclimate to society, and sustain their well-being here in Lake County and across Indiana. So once again, accepting the award is Mr. Matthew Vincent. He's the Deputy Director of Indiana Veteran Affairs. And also with us is Mr. James Brown, the Director of the Indiana Department of Veteran Affairs. <laughs> Our next award will be presented by Ms. Laura Wynn and Ms. Jane Valesca. I'm going to present this award. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you do the photo, I'm going to present this award. I am extremely, extremely honored to be able to give this gentleman this um, honor. Um, we started as a very small, little, humble organization, and I think the way that we met you is we wanted to do an event at your place. And um, as we did our little event, um, Mr. Spiros Batistados, um, who is the CEO of the South Shore CDA, which is, our, which is our visitors association, was intrigued by what it was that we did and decided that he wanted to be a part of the family, as we like to call our board members. And um, I remember one day we were at a board meeting and um, we were 
uh, going over the mission and vision and decided, the board decided they wanted to make some changes to that. And so um, we were trying to figure out what our vision was going to be. We got the mission now. And um, Mr. Badistados came up with a vision that kind of blew all of our, <laughs> our minds away because it was such a big vision. You know, one of the things that I've learned is that many of us struggle with that big vision. You know, we, we do the easy step by steps, but we are afraid to reach or give ourselves that end goal that's the, the big one. And so um, I'm grateful to this man because um, after we get from this award, a gentleman's going to be standing up here to um, tell you about some data that we've collected in all these years that is about to put this agency in the realm of, of his vision of being the preeminent authority on parenting for urban families. And so we never thought we would, I'm not going to say we never thought that we would get there, but I just, you know, like maybe when I was old and with a walker and stuff kind of thing. So I just am grateful that you had the vision that we needed and that we were too, I guess, young or scared to have. So, <laughs> so with that, um, I am just honored and grateful to you because we're here because of you. And I just want to say thank you. So he received Visionary Leader of Distinction um, because he was a visionary leader. He wasn't just a leader. Um, to Mr. Spiros Baristados. And I've never known what these initials mean. <laughs> um, he's our chair emeritus of the Indian Parenting Institute. The merits are sorry. That was the <laughs> I could have seen a microphone and it turned down. So <laughs> let me be very brief because I know all of you had a long day. Um, congratulations to all of you. You're the ones making it happen. Um, thank you for the kind words, but it's really your work on a day to day basis that has moved Indiana Parenting Institute to where it is today, and I know where it's going. I would challenge each of you in the room, though, not to think of just this organization and what it can do for families and children, but I would challenge you to ask yourself what your organization can do. I will share with you that the organization I run has had 15 babies come through the office in the past 21 years. We allow parents, men or women, to bring their children to work for the four, first four to six months of their life. And you might say, huh, how do you do that? How do you get away with that? It's got to be distracting. It's got to be I, I call my little time sponges. Uh, they do. They soak up some resources, but they so they they save your organization a whole lot more. And the woman who started it, the first baby, Carolyn, turned 21 this year, and her mother was going to quit because she didn't know what to do. These children are developmentally months ahead of their peers because they're in an office setting where they're hearing words and conversation and language. I and mean, you can tell me more about this than I can tell you, but I know these kids are smarter and more successful because they had that chance. So I'm going to challenge all of you, and I know it's not going to be easy to do in every setting, but can you do a family day once a month? Can you have bring your kids to work more often than you're doing? What is it that you can do to engage children so they can see their parents being successful and productive and in the workplace? So I'm deeply humbled. Thank you very much. Uh, I know you guys are going to continue the great work. Thank you for indulging me, and thank you for all of you for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this time we'd like to bring to the stage <laughs> Mr. Hubert Morgan. He's the principal of Stan Hope Consulting, and he'll share with you IPI research data and what it's revealed. So he's the guy that shows that what they actually do here works. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to just acknowledge this tremendous presentation that you guys have. Um, and there are a few faces that um, I'm familiar with. Um, I see that the mayor uh, skipped out. Um, so I know that time is of the essence, and I know that you guys will leave. Um, so, so there are a couple kind of definitional things that I would uh, love to be able to share. And the vision statement is where I would like to start. 
because that gives me an entree into any type of expertise that might be here. Um, children and the topics we talk about definitely isn't that. I do have kids and my kids have done well. So it allows me to be able to look back at some of the behaviors that we do and say, my goodness, we should all be in a place that we're not stressed promptly or socially. Um, so I'm going to get to the vision statement because um, as a long range planner, vision statements are things that um, become heritage to me. To be the preeminent authority on parenting education for urban families. So I just wanted to break that down a little bit. When I go into what it is that I'd like to present, we're all using the same and understanding the same language. Vision. So long range, five, 10. In urban planning, we say in the next 40 years. But let me define it a little bit differently. When everything starts to come into focus, we're going to use that as a definition for what we're going to hear. Authority, the right to command and make good decisions. So again, when we think about um, the vision statement, authority was one of the words that we hear. We need to understand authority, the right to command and make good decisions. Preeminent, surpassing all others and being distinguished. What a vision statement. So, okay, <clears throat> I was asked to be able to look at um, the data. There's a treasure trove of data that IDAG has over the last few years. I'm not sure if you realize just how much of a treasure trove it would have been 10 years ago when we started. There is about seven forms that all of the time school commanders have to fill out. I have started a spreadsheet to be able to do data entry in terms of this. This is not my work, but seeing the vision and having a relationship with uh, the leadership here, I said, you know, let me work with you guys to see where this is going to take place. I now have literally, so those of you who do Excel here, I have gone now to N, Q in my spreadsheet. So, A to the end of the alphabet sequence of columns, we are now way beyond 400 columns of data entry, right? One of the things that we want to be able to do is say, who are you serving, right? And what are they saying coming into what needs we have as parents? Uh, how do we evaluate when the parents are coming in? Uh, how do they evaluate? Mrs. Rose and all of us, right? So there are all of these columns that we have. Um, let me just start um, with this. Then I'm glad that you spoke about um, the audience time that we have because there are certain things that we might be able to do. We are so quick to judge. We're quick to judge because how could these parents be in the situation that they're in? What is happening? Why is there their technology as it but let me say that it's not they, it is us. We walk down the street and they're part of us. What we have collected is just a small slice. We are going to be collecting over 400 plus um, all the sorts of data. Um, we have this demographic data that tells us their age, their income, um, what type of um, marital status that they might be, how are they employed, how much money they make. And when we ask how much money they make, how much stress that they have, and says how much money that they make, and the expectations that we have is that they have to give us to keep up with this. Oh my goodness, it just doesn't add up. Um, what's your family makeup? What type of happiness quotient were you growing up? How do you evaluate your parents and the role that they play as a parent? All things that we have collected. The amount of kids that we have, period. Why do they come? The needs that they have uh, as they come, your your educational attainment, and there's some things that I would just like to say before I step back. When we ask, what are your needs? It's very basic. 
wanted to let you know about those two. I also wanted to thank our photographer, Ms. Amber Green. She is wonderful. You guys should check out some of her work. And the Veterans Cafe. Um, if you haven't eaten there, go eat there. It's really, really good. So I just wanted to make sure I'm doing house cleaning. So thank you all. Have a wonderful, oh, I'll look at you guys. Thank you all. Have a wonderful um, Easter or whatever you celebrate. And um, she's going to thank staff for the office. That makes it Anyway, um, I just want to say that putting on an ordinance, putting on a, an event like this, and I can't imagine what you go through when I look at the number of people that come to your event. And that's kind of like, you guys will start two years before. But then you and Stella will probably start six months or it, it requires a lot of work. And one of the things, the other, the way that you get it done is that you have people who are tremendously committed to that cause and who give their time and sometimes with us time without pay to so to do the work that needs to be done to put this group together. I especially want to thank all of the staff. Uh, Therese, Rose, uh, who else is there? Valerie, uh, Mel Melanie, Lawana, hi Lawana, um, and our volunteers, and my daughter, but I also want to thank Tara Nelson. Raise your hand, Tara Nelson. Tara, thank you, Donna. Tara is a, um, I'll tell you how good she is at what she does. Marty said to me, our board chair, that she needed Tara, that she needed more people like Tara. And that, that's no, you know, put down, but just the fact that she's so organized. She keeps everybody in sync with everything. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Thank you for the opportunity to give it to us. I, think, I, I believe that everybody received it. You, one thing Rose said to me is that you confirmed for us that we are moving in the right direction. So thank you for your work. Thank you for coming and being with us today. We really appreciate it. Did you guys enjoy learning? In other words, we have two books. How May I Serve You? I would like to give one of these books to our parents, to our parents that got the award today. choose to do something about it. So you will find this little slither 
of a card in your 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 swag bag when you leave. So make sure you stick it somewhere where you can see it every day that everybody and every adult needs to give a hoot about parenting. Because think about this, if we don't, then we will raise another generation of children that are not living up to the standards that are required to live productively within our society. And that is not good news. Okay, so that's a gift in your bag. The other thing I'd like to share with you is this. It's a meet and greet that is being sponsored by our board of directors. And the purpose of this meet and greet, and it's on April 13th from 5 to 7, and it's in the Centennial Room at 504 Broadway in Mary, which is where our offices are located. It's not in our office. Um, and it says, join Indiana Parenting Institute Board of Directors for its first annual meet and greet and networking and wine tasting event for community leaders. Dialogue with us on how the work of Indiana Parenting Institute it benefits children and families and enrich the health of businesses and communities. Businesses are relying upon having a, a next generation of well-prepared children or adults. <laughs> and if we don't do something about it now and come up with solutions collaboratively to address those issues, then we will still have gaps in employment, jobs available for which we do not have qualified uh, people to hold. And we need to end that. And we can end that. And that's what this means. So we do hope that you come and be a part of it. It's in your swag bag when you leave. Okay. I'm done. Yeah. Thank you all very much. <laughs>